Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Daniel A. Heller, PhD. Uh, He's at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, he's looking at biomaterials and nanoscale engineering for molecular sensors and targeted therapeutics uh, to address cancer. So, Daniel, thanks for coming. Great to be here. Thanks a lot, Richard. Yeah, in, in your own words, what, uh, what are your current projects? What are you working on? So, I, uh, my, my lab is uh, developing nanomaterials uh, for the uh, treatment and uh, detection of cancer and, and other diseases, and also as, uh, to make research tools to try to to probe biological systems. So is it to detect cancer as early as possible, or is it to uh, characterize it once it's in somebody, or what stage? Yeah, we, we have a project where, a couple projects where we're uh, working to d- make sensors that detect cancer at, at the earliest stages uh, to try to detect, um, for instance, uh, ovarian cancer, which is uh, a type of cancer that often uh, is detected at later stages when it's hard to treat. So we're making uh, imp- actually implantable uh, sensors, uh, devices to, um, uh, to, to monitor um, ovarian cancer for early to stage detection and also uh, risk of recurrence, uh, people who have risk factors like BRCA mutations. What, what does the sensor look at? Like where would it be implanted and what is it characterizing? We, uh, we found that um, the, the current biomarkers and known biomarkers for ovarian cancer are these blood biomarkers. And they could potentially be good uh, uh, monitors, except that in the blood, they, they don't appear uh, at high enough levels above baseline uh, to be able to uh, detect them until uh, later stages. So we realized that the, the biology of this cancer is such that these markers uh, seem to appear at higher levels in the, for instance, in the fallopian tube, the uterine cavity, the uterus, at higher levels earlier than, uh, than they, when they appear in the blood. It's kind of the way the body, the, the, uh, the bodies, uh, these cancer cells are, are connected to the blood. They, um, so we think that we could access these markers uh, at earlier stages and detect the cancer uh, if we could monitor these markers in these locations. Why don't people try to characterize lymph? Uh, it seems like, unfortunately, that's an early place that a lot of cancers go, regardless of the cancer. Yeah, there, there's definitely uh, thoughts of, of how to do that, how to monitor lymph. The, one of the issues is that um, it's uh, monitoring the lymph in maybe the right, the right part of the body in, in lymph glands might be uh, difficult to really know where to look and, and when. The, the issue is always that, um, that, that for screening, um, you don't know uh, kind of who to, who, who to select to really kind of look at, uh, uh, to, to, to try to monitor. And if you have a, a, a type of um, method that's, that's maybe more invasive or, or expensive, involves imaging and, um, or, or, or taking fluid from somewhere, the question is how to, how to pair this, this, the, all the people in the world down to uh, a manageable number where you can screen or, or, or monitor. And so we're, we're making a sensor to try to implant uh, into patients that either that have a, a, a major risk factor where we think that um, if we can monitor uh, markers in the place where we think they're going to appear, uh, we'll be able to um, ha- uh, you benefit from the fact that we know that kind of locally in, in, the, in the uterus and uh, fallopian tubes, there'll, there'll be higher levels of these markers potentially at early stages, earlier stages of, of uh, disease. Um, but is, is there anyone no um, why, um, why in lymph nodes one wouldn't want to maybe put a marker, put a sensor there one day? Yeah, if there's a biopsy and it's discovered, I mean, it seems like maybe one of the best ways or a good way is to get to, uh, since a lot of lymph nodes get taken out as part of resections, I mean, knowing that maybe putting a sensor attaching to one or more of them that are probably going to be taken out anyway or possibly. It might be a good monitoring point. Yeah, no, that would be uh, 
Um, that would be a really cool uh, way, to, uh, way to go. With it. Certainly with cancers that appear in lymph nodes at, at pretty early stages or at, at, uh, in the time course of their uh, progression, that would be a great, uh, uh, a great direction. And I guess I, I, I mentioned ovarian cancer because that's what kind of is going on right now in my lab. But the, the direction we're headed is really the thought of, of monitoring and you have in um, many patients or many, many people are thinking about, um, about wearable devices, for instance, uh, Apple watches and, uh, and Fitbits, where you're shooting light at the body constantly and you're getting a measurement of something. Right now, you're measuring uh, your pulse and, uh, and that's an important for fitness. And, and we thought, well, is there a way to interface the, these wearable devices with something uh, that's in the body, like a, a biomarker, a protein, um, a, uh, a, a metabolite, is there a way to get measurements from of these types of molecules that may be better markers for disease um, using uh, a device like a, like a wearable device or, or something that can just shoot light at the body? And because if you ever look at the Apple Watch, you look at the bottom, if you're wearing one, you see this light uh, shooting at your skin. We wondered, you know, can we use that light to, um, to compare with us something in the body to then get a signal back out of the body for, um, to, to measure a disease? And that's kind of where we're going with this uh, uh, from a ovarian cancer sensor to kind of, can we me- make a sensor that measures almost anything you want, but, but non-invasively, where if we could just um, get something maybe in the body that could be nanoscale, nan- or very small at least, um, to, to, um, and the idea is that we, these, and we are using, uh, carbon nanotubes for this, that they give off an infrared signal and they can take, uh, they can accept, uh, or be excited and, and uh, by light that's red or infrared that can pass through the body, uh, at least a few millimeters to even centimeters. And so we're trying to make, uh, sensors to, uh, to, to measure these markers, it could be a blood marker, but it could be, or, or a local marker, like I was talking about with the, the ovarian cancer, and then get that uh, signal out of the body um, and to be able to get a real-time monitor of a, uh, of a biomarker. Why not um, try to look at blood, but look at, sur- at surface vessels? You know, like I'm looking at my hand and my wrist, there's some vessels, you know, maybe I'm more vascular, but there's some right at the surface there that, I don't know, I guess would be, less than a millimeter away, if I wore a watch on my wrist, the light probably would be a, maybe could monitor the condition of my blood or maybe on people's thigh. I don't know where, you know, veins are the most prevalent and most near the surface, maybe the ear, but maybe you could return to the blood and monitor it. I know you want to monitor other things too, but maybe you look at the same thing, you know, lymph, where is, where are lymph glands located closest to the, the surface of the skin? And then maybe you can get access to different tissue types in the body without having to be invasive. That's, that's exactly right. If we, if, if we can implant something in those locations that kind of stay there and uh, we don't need this to be kind of a nano robot that, that goes around the body and looks for things. It's, some, it's really just a small uh, uh, a device or, or a set of particles that are implanted under the skin, not too deep, maybe millimeters and it could be in a, in, a, in, a, in a lymph node, it could be in, uh, in, in you know, your lymph vessels, it could be near blood vessels with access to, to, the, to the serum, to the plasma, to the blood. And, uh, and then if uh, we can leave that there and then just continuously or every intermittently shine the light at it and um, with certain nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes, we can, uh, we can shoot light at them. They give off another uh, wavelength of light, even further red or infrared, um, that can pass through uh, millimeters to centimeters of tissue, and that light can we can we can make these sensors such that they change their intensity or wavelength when um, they bind to a, a certain biomarker, and then we can get that, um, and that signal can be sent right to a, a watch or something like that that exactly can can monitor uh, uh, get a real time monitor of a. Uh, uh, of a marker, and certainly this could be useful for glucose, but uh, but also for things um, for other uh, other blood markers, um, blood chemistry, anything that you would really want in any sort of blood test. But even markers like for for can- uh, cancer biomarkers, potentially even for um, for 
snippets of, of snort, short snippets of, uh, of DNA or RNA. Um, why, uh, why, why ovarian cancer? Why not pick a blood cancer? Because then it's, you know pretty much exactly where it's going to start and, and hang out most of the time. Why this one where it, uh, it makes it harder for maybe an obvious device to be made or you know, requiring one to be implanted? Right, it, it, for the ovarian cancer uh, sensing, we're, we're really making something that's similar to the size and shape of an IUD. So in this case, it's not completely non-invasive to implant this, but it's a routine procedure. Um, but the reason we started with ovarian cancer kind of goes back to how this, this project got started and, and, and maybe a little bit of, of, uh, of background uh, could be helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm a biomedical engineer and I decided for my faculty career not to go to a biomedical and or engineering department. Uh, I, uh, I went to a, to a cancer center. So I'm at uh, Sloan Kettering and, uh, at Cancer Center and also have a position with the Cornell, Weill Cornell Medicine, uh, the medical school of, of, of Cornell uh, University. And so my lab is an engineering lab, but surrounded by a, a, a biomedical institution or several biomedical institutions. And I realized that it, it could really make a difference to be an engineer surrounded by biologists and uh, clinicians because I would be surrounded by, I'm a, I'm a, as, a, as an engineer, I'm looking for problems and make, trying to make solutions, trying to make technologies to, um, to address problems. But the best place I could think of being is, is surrounded by problems. And that's what you get by being in a cancer center. And so I, by being there, I, started just talking to people. And, and my, when I started my faculty career there in 2012, I started talking and, and I, I ran into a uh, clinician uh, there named uh, Doug Levine, who is a gynecologic oncologist, so an ovarian cancer uh, clinician. And he said, you know what we need, Dan? We need a sensor for ovarian cancer because that's just about the biggest problem in ovarian cancer that we can't detect it early enough uh, to get... Uh, uh, to, to be able to treat it well enough to, to really uh, cure people of this disease. And I said, you know, this is perfect. This is exactly why I came to a cancer center, because I could find someone like you that could, um, could, could really point me in the direction of a problem. And certainly it's not the most accessible problem in terms of the, the markers, potentially, um, but, it, it, but we realized that we could really, at the earliest stages of, our, of this project, make this technology focused towards um, detecting uh, uh, ovarian cancer because that's a really uh, important problem. Oh, Good question here with ovarian cancer. I'm just thinking: Do women that have it still cycle? And if so, could you put sensors on a tampon or even a pad so at least once every three weeks or so you could have a uh, you know for the week of menstruation, but once every three weeks or once every month at least you can monitor their condition that way without being invasive at all. Yeah, actually, there's been a trial where um, someone has uh, done something like this. They were actually measuring, um, uh, I think, DNA uh, mutations. So they were taking a, a tampon and they were, they were, uh, they, they were then taking the, um, the material from that and putting it onto a, um, uh, and doing PCR and, and measuring uh, uh, for um, mutations. And so there has been uh, some, a, a little bit of work in this area. Um, I think there needs to be more because people haven't, uh, certainly haven't cracked this egg. And, and part of it is about, um, it is about when you detect and part is where you detect and, and then part is what you detect. And so, um, you know, the sensor that the, the markers that we're measuring now, we're starting with a few and we're trying to ramp it up. Um, but, um, but right now there's been just, there has been a little bit of work in this and that's a really, a really good idea. Well, what's your, um, I'm just giving you my ideas, but what's, what's your best idea so far on where the sensor should be? And I think you mentioned kind of like an IUD that would be implanted that way. Yeah, right now we're thinking that um, an I, if, it, if we can implant something like an IU, like a, that looks like an IUD but doesn't function like one, it would, it would collect biomarkers. And, uh, and, and the, the idea is that if we could get a transient response or transient um, collection, of marker, if we can put something that dwells there, um, then we have the possibility of looking at and then potentially monitoring it multiple times over the course of, of, a, of a time frame that you put in there. It could, be, it could be weeks, it could be months, it could be longer. Um, that it might be possible to, uh, to uh, see these markers at, at um, higher levels um, when they appear there 
but also um, get a kind of a cumulative um, measurement. So it's so even if these markers are at low levels, because this sensor is dwelling there, it might be able to detect uh, something that uh, if you just measure at an early at like a single time point, uh, you won't be able to kind of get this cumulative uh, response or cumul you know, accumulation of the, of the marker. So we're trying to bank on a few different ideas at the same time. One is having something, this accumulation. One is putting um, the sensor in a certain location where the markers appear uh, at higher levels. Um, and then the, the question is always exactly when you put, would put this into a person and what um, risk factors are the best risk, risk factors to, to think about. So we're... Well, a good platform would be for existing IUDs if you're able to add a small sensor onto them and then you recruit, uh, if they're willing, a population of women that would be getting them anyway, maybe they get subsidized or something to have them because they want them anyway. And then in healthy people, you could monitor and see at least what happens to a device that's used that way, you know, and when it's removed, what kind of things, you know, uh, lock up the sensors, et cetera. Maybe that's a great way to inform how your device may perform. Yep, exactly. You know, that's, uh, that, that would be a, uh, being able to get this kind of um, transient measurement, a measurement of uh, multiple data points over time um, is, is a great way to, to, try to, um, to try to get at an issue where most of the time in the past people have been, or currently people are looking at a single data point. Um, but if you can really kind of um, uh, interrogate this device, get a have sensor that can get you can more continuous readings, um, the other thought was that we could, um, uh, if, if we could get, even if the biomarker levels are relatively low, but we just can tell whether they're increasing and look at the rate of change, that is, could be a really nice uh, way to measure mar uh, markers that might be at lower levels um, than uh, and at low levels. But if for each patient, you can monitor kind of the, uh, uh, people talk about it as the, as the biomarker velocity. Is, is there much work being done to look at at least somewhat longitudinally? You know, when someone has cancer, for instance, has their blood been drawn at, let's say, one month intervals for two years while they have it? Has this been a major area of study? And if so, what does that show if you do something like that for various types of cancers? You know, have people looked at how the biomarkers for uh, the blood condition trends? Yeah, the, um, there's definitely work out there, especially... The, one, the work that I hear most often is in um, prostate cancer um, and where people are doing um, PSA the, uh, uh, is the, is the uh, marker that people think about in prostate cancer. And it's always a bit difficult because that marker is not, the, not a perfect biomarker. But um, there is this PSA velocity um, issue and, and people are really um, using this kind of rate of change of the marker levels uh, in prostate cancer for monitoring. And prostate cancer is, is a different kind of um, problem where there's many people who get prostate cancer who really aren't going to progress to, a, to an advanced, uh, uh, very aggressive cancer. But a certain percentage, I think around 20%, are going to have uh, a, that conversion from a more of a, 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 a from a, from a, Cancer, where you can really just kind of monitor this thing, but but not um, but not really in, intervene to something where you really need to intervene. And so people uh, calculate uh, PSA velocity as one marker of this. It's not perfect, and uh, and definitely there's um, there, there, there's uh, there needs to be more markers uh, or no, more ways to, to to detect the conversion of a, of of what they call indolent uh, disease to uh, aggressive disease. But um, that this is an active uh, area of research and even um, use in, in the clinic. Well, I can tell you, I, I have no clue if these markers at all have any cycling or response. Let's say versus blood glu glucose. But I've worn like a, you know like a Dexcom G6 for a series of months, and I can tell you one data point is crap compared to thousands of data points and looking exactly. at trends and cycles and all that stuff. So, I mean, it seems like this would be very important for all kinds of cancers and looking at the markers and characterizing, do they cycle? How do they cycle? What do they do? I know there's confounding factors, but this seems like a whole area that needs to be studied. Oh yeah, uh, exactly. And I think biomarker, biomarker development, biomarker, uh, there's, there's many people looking at biomarkers 
uh, and trying to understand when, when it's best to, to try to measure these and is there something particularly useful. Um, my lab is, is, ha, is so far hasn't really been focused as much on uh, discovery of new biomarkers, but uh, trying to make technologies to allow biomarkers to be measured in new ways like uh, transiently or, or you know, real time, uh, measured more often, measured locally, measured in a non-invasive way, like with a Apple Watch or Fitbit. But um, yeah, but, but I, and I think that with the uh, these new technologies coming online and more people thinking about um, you know the non-invasive ways, making non-invasive technologies for uh, monitoring markers, I, I think there's going to be um, new um, uh, important ways to, to measure these markers that are going to potentially make a marker that that wasn't as useful, more useful, or even um, find new ways to, to discover biomarkers um, that maybe not have been good biomarkers in the past. So what's, um, I mean, what's your progression from here? Are you, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could go. What do you think is going to be the most uh, expedited path? What, what, will, what will that evolve over the next year or two? So from our lab's uh, standpoint, um, we're, we're working with our uh, clinical collaborator to um, make a clinical trial for, uh, for this uh, IUD-like device. But we're really also in the, at, at the stage where we have to think about how to take this technology and develop it for, um, you know, to make it a, a, a more clinical uh, technology. Because in our lab, we can't really just make something and try it in people. So um, part of it is about, um, I think, a lot about the... Uh, aspects of translation of a, of a technology and, and, how, uh, and, and how to potentially start a, start a small biotech company to try to think about um, this. And we have kind of been on the very early stage of that because we would need to raise funds to develop this technology. Um, but then in, in the lab, we're thinking about how can we really interface the body um, with or interface, um, uh, really create the best interface between um, a, a marker for cancer or any disease, and um, and a pay, and, and a and a doctor who can who can maybe make uh, decisions. And so, right now we have this kind of IUD technology, um, but the basis of the technology is really uh, this nanosensor that can be put into many form factors. And that's where we're thinking about how we can best move this towards um, uh, uh, towards the development of something that. Um, can be useful for many uh, types of, of diseases and, and thinking about, say, this, this kind of uh, implant under, or, or interface with a wearable device where something can be non-invasively measured um, um, in real, you know, by, for, for many purposes. And so we're really moving towards this kind of um, fitness tracker type um, paradigm because we think it could be useful for many different uh, markers uh, and not just cancer. Right? And, you know, since we, uh, if we think about... Uh, Things like you know, now in these days, we're thinking about COVID and um, we also are thinking about um, markers that might be early stage um, uh, uh, measurements or maybe not early, super early, but measurements that could tell someone whether they're going to get really sick or uh, an early stage marker of uh, cytokine storm syndrome um, where the body start really, starts really reacting against um, uh, or, or, or ramping up the immune system uh, may be uh, too much. And so we're trying to think uh, in this way as well. Can we make a, a, a measurement for, for these kind of things? Yeah. Well, the, you know, the work you're doing is like very innovative and it's excellent. It's very much needed. So yeah, it's, it's wonderful. What's the best way for people to keep tabs and find out more about uh, the work you're doing? Where can they go? So we um, are, are uh, I have a Twitter feed, but, uh, and also we have a, um, uh, my, my, my Twitter handle is, is Heller Lab, and, uh, and, but my, uh, my lab's website is, uh, is at uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and so my, I could just be Googled uh, under Daniel Heller and Sloan Kettering, and, and, it, and it will pop up. Okay. Well, very good. Daniel, thank you for coming. It's been a really good call, and I'm glad, uh, you're, again, you're doing this work. Likewise. Thank you so much, Richard. Great talking to you. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. 
This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.